Got the best of my love, oh, oh. You got the best of my love, oh, oh. Got the best of my love, oh, oh. You got the best of my love. I swear to God, I used to know the lyrics to more songs. I think they got pushed out of my head. Or that part of my brain died. I think that's more likely. Uh, I think that's statistically more likely to be the case. But you know what? I'm just going to go with there's like finite amount of brain room and uh, some of it got popped out in favor of others. And you know what? I'll take what I've got. It's working for me so far. We'll see. One thing is, is when I was a kid, I used to like try to set about memorizing song lyrics. Like I didn't even do it passively. I would write them out and stuff. Now I don't listen to enough music to have it happen, to have the reinforcement. Even to the old stuff that I used to remember. I don't know, I stopped. I don't listen to as much music as I used to. I probably should fix that. I, I need to like get away from my old deal, which is like I couldn't really enjoy a song unless I could sing along to it. Like, I have to be singing. I have to be producing, you know, some sort of uh, part of it. And a verbal part. Like, I've realized over the years that I'm, my brain is incredibly uh, unbalanced in, uh, you know, like intuitive uh, stuff, like things that make sense, things that uh, things that are like relatively easy to grasp. They are all connected very specifically to to the English language, which is incredibly fucking narrow plank to build uh, your life around. Uh, but I've managed. The rest of my brain is just very bad. I mean, it's not just that it's bad. It's that I'm also a lazy, fat American swine who was never forced to, you know, get better, uh, get more uh, in touch with certain things. I was able to kind of float. And so here I am with just an ossified brain. It's just getting, getting smaller by the day. It's doing the anti-rich piano. Oh well. But this is just a way to say that like pure music by itself, I don't know. Because I, I stopped listening to music and I started listening to podcasts. But uh, now I don't even really listen to that many podcasts. Like two or three at the most. And really only when I'm exercising. Maybe I should listen to some more classical. Like the opposite of what I'm used to. Just pure moods, as they say. Uh, okay, so today we're going to talk about the part, third part, I believe, of making a global capitalism, uh, which is all about the crisis of the 70s and how it starts to break up this uh, internationalized New Deal structure that had built the post-war economy. Because that is really how 
they describe it, and I think it is an effective way to imagine it, is, is that the, that the uh, post-war uh, uh, Western sort of labor peace that defined the politics of that generation uh, was a internationalization of the New Deal because the United States, thanks to its specific balance of class forces and resources, uh, was able to synthesize the contradictions of capitalism much more effectively than the European powers were, uh, or Japan for that matter. They were, too, they were playing catch up in a lot of ways with the United States. In the fascists, in the case of the fascists, literally. I mean, World War II was the tale of uh, capitalist development in Western Europe and Japan, which, you know, by the late 1800s is, has caught up to Europe uh, in, like, the capitalist race. Uh, the tale, the last ones to get it, the last ones to uh, create a geographically, like, extended sphere of influence, not just a capitalist economy, crucially, a sphere of influence. They were the last ones, which means they were sucking hind tit, and they were banging up against established spheres of influence. So boom, they went to, they went, they had to, uh, their internal contradictions pushed them outward uh, to war. Uh, and that made them not uh, a viable host for capitalism, not stable enough. It's the way that viruses don't really want to be deadly. That's not genetically advantageous to a virus to kill a lot of the people it infects because that limits the amount of transmission that the host can do by its death and the death of the viruses is within it. Uh, like, so if you have like a, a virus just rampaging through a body like Ebola, that's capitalism ripping through the societies of Germany and, and Japan, uh, the losers of World War One, the economic, not even the uh, like actual battle losers, the economic losers of World War One, because that's the thing with Italy. Italy was technically on the on the on the winning side of World War One, but they didn't get that much out of it, and that defined their uh, you know crisis ridden economy after the war. So. By the time you get the big crisis of capitalism, the internal structures of these fascist nationalist states that could not uh, resolve socially the contradictions at its heart, right? Because uh, the premise here is to maintain the nation as like this uh, axis of identity, as opposed to class interest, which means you keep embedded in this uh, structure this class antagonism defining your society, which like is what drives it to its extremes of violence. But that violence, although, yes, there is a domestic regime of terror, it has to be exceeded by a campaign of uh, external violence. Because someone is, everyone is hurting in these structures. Everyone is being massively alienated in these structures. Uh, and, yes, yeah, Spain's another good example. They didn't even fight in the war, but they were still way behind the pack economically by the, t uh, by the time the real crisis of uh, capitalism in the 30s hits. So, yeah, like, so capitalism running through these, rampaging through these systems, right, where these nationalist structures are being forced to dump off the alienation through uh, economic regimes that are Capitalism wedded to a state project of expansion. Like, they keep capitalism, but with this overarching nationalist agenda that is in, co in direct conflict with the interests of capitalism, which is international trade, which is the extension across the entire globe of a single common market space, which is the opposite of the sort of defined geographic zones of influence and power and domination that these, uh, these latecomers to the imperial race are uh, producing. So they've got Ebola. Uh, the, the Western democracies that can't really defend themselves, uh, they've, got, uh, uh, they've got like maybe smallpox or how, what's something? Typhoid, cholera. And then we have got uh, the common cold. The United States has got the common cold. Now capitalism is traveling through our fucking system at light speed. 
uh, because it has synthesized those contradictions, because that violence is being carried out by someone who can't speak up for themselves, somebody who isn't part of the integrated uh, uh, global system, someone who cannot add their uh, like resistance to the cost-benefit ledgers of uh, capitalism. The expropriated Native Americans and, and, uh, and enslaved Africans. That's the secret sauce. So you've created now a Mer American polity where everybody has this sense of themselves as citizens of a country that has its, their best interests at heart. Where the thing that, that what's best for the government is best for the economy is best for me. These are all the same things. That's a thing you can believe in. Only in this context, though, of American development. Where the people feeling the really sharp edge of the stick of alienation are not part of the fucking polity. Like, that's the difference between like the U.S. treatment of blacks and Germany's treatment of Jews, is that Jews have been fully fucking uh, assimilated into European society, uh, German society since Napoleon, or at least since 1848. Uh, yeah, there's still discrimination, but it is not system systematic. Then they have to go in and throughout this body politic pick a scapegoat, and Jews were an acceptable scapegoat. They were unsympathetic to many Germans because their survival strategy in this maelstrom had been to grab onto those things that will help you advance through uh, the, the, the struggle of, in the marketplace. In America, we never had to have that ritualized finding of a scapegoat because there was this seamless, in, this pure conception of American, Americanism that like wasn't universally held, like there's racism, discrimination at all levels, but that reproduced a generalized sense of American identity that transcended their uh, self-conception as members of a class. This didn't happen in Germany, uh, at least not initially, because capitalism was expropriating and alienating the people who were part of the general German or French or English people. They could only be so uh, so dehumanized. And I gotta say, we, we always wonder, well, why why England of all the countries of Europe? Why did why did it start there? A big part, I believe, is that they, by having a colonial relationship with Ireland that prefigured the American colonial relationship, uh, were were able to like. Uh, vent social uh, uh, gases, basically, uh, and build uh, machinery of domination and of, uh, you know, marketization uh, in these expropriated spaces. So the New Deal is what this looks like in terms of a, uh, a treaty, basically, between America's working class as part of a greater uh, uh, category of uh, non-capital-owning Americans, which goes from like artisans, uh, uh, proletarians, uh, even like I would say yeoman farmers who are self-sufficient compared to those people who like have massive concentrations of capital. Uh, like that, that group of people who understood themselves to be part of one polity, making a deal with capital and with government, this like these, the state and capital, the two faces of one greater thing that uh, hegemony allows us only to interact with across this, like, uh, through this Janus screen, right? Like, we are only allowed, as Americans, to see capital as either the market or the state at one time. We can only ever address one or the other at one time, which masks the fact that they're the same thing at a deeper, more fundamental level that determines their relationship to each other and their relationship to you.
so crisis of capitalism that causes uh, genocide uh, and uh, world war in Europe and Asia kills a third of the world's population or whatever not that much she kills a bunch of people uh, and in America you get this thing that can fight that war win that war and then come out basically unscathed so this project we're talking about of making global capitalism at first is taking that administrative New Deal state and applying its structures to the economies of these uh, recently uh, traumatized countries and the peripheral and of course as they come into the market the post-colonial periphery as they're being like offloaded by their colonial overseers who can no longer afford them the direct empire is no longer affordable it has to be made efficient and it is made efficient by the introduction of American market structures to replace formal regimes of power and that means allowing Europe to be basically a little sandbox a little fantasy fake uh, uh, political economy where people got to pretend that they were fighting over you know control of means of production that were actually controlled in Washington and they can carry out those politics because this machine we're building is dumping capital into these countries, Europe specifically, more than anybody, dumping fucking capital into it uh, through these new structures that are extensions of the New Deal state. And that allows them to rebuild this social democratic consensus that is more, more advanced and more civilized than ours, but only because the exploitation at its heart has been abstracted away to the imperial core that's actually carrying out the final decision making that set the term for all the other politics that happens in Europe and anywhere else. And so by the mid 60s, you're seeing the first uh, shutters of this machine because it's packed with contradictions and those contradictions are going to work themselves out over time, which means Different conditions are going to, uh, a condition of, of entropy is going to enter into uh, to this uh, new system that has been established. Entropy starts as soon as you establish Bretton Woods, and it drives through the system uh, all through this boom period that builds this robust global capitalist nexus with these uh, social democratic or social democratic trending democracies at their center against like a, a totalitarian Soviet uh, opposition, even though that Soviet system is still subordinate to the global capitalist order and is just a part of it and is, is, is not set uh, its own independent economic uh, first mover. The first mover is the United States at this point. Uh, so by the mid 60s, these uh, contradictions start kicking in. Uh, so that's why this chapter is called Contradictions of Success. Uh, so the U.S. helps build up this robust manufacturing economy in Europe, starts trading with it. Well, what that means is eventually the European manufacturing industry stood up on its own, is able to adapt all of America's uh, uh, efficiencies, uh, is able to get all the technological things that help like improve, increase productivity and increase efficiency to so maximize profit. They, could, they get all that stuff. America has a head start, but, once, uh, but since the U.S. is not advancing faster than uh, the Europe is catching up, pretty soon that's putting huge pressure on the dollar. Dollars get sucked out of the country. You go from a situation where in the, in the mid-50s there's barely any dollars in the European economy uh, that's and the, uh, that uh, most of that ends up being uh, Marshall Fund, Marshall Plan money. By the mid '60s, it's reversed, and there's this huge dollar glut in Europe, and a lot of it is fueled by uh, uh, the fact that that uh, private sector investment, that direct foreign investment, that the U.S. Cap uh, private capital was not sending to Europe right after the war; they were sending it to Latin America. Uh, by the early 60s, it completely shifts. Part of that is because in 1958, there's a recession in the United States, and that capital starts going, looking for uh, better returns elsewhere. And they find them in this robust, growing uh, uh, European manufacturing trade network. Uh, but all of this was 
uh, putting huge pressure on the system of fixed exchange rates that define the Bretton Woods structure. Saying like, we're not gonna, like the way it is now, you can go and every day there's a new uh, exchange rate between different currencies. Like the lira just keeps going up, you know? Uh, and the US during the, the boom period is able to impose this, it's not the dollar, uh, it's basically a global uh, gold standard. Because even though, you know, the U.S. doesn't ha have the same relationship with gold in it, uh, that it had like before FDR, there's still a gold peg to the dollar, which means they are able to impose a global, uh, global gold standard, which is what limits inflation, which is that, you know, that, con that, that uh, inflation is, the, is the, like the result of the friction of uh, class conflict within a society, like uh, given off within their economy. Like that is that is the uh, that is the uh, economic manifestation of class conflict within a society. Uh, the more smooth the gears of social organ are, like you know we're fighting a war or we're having a really cool booming post-war era where everything's fat and happy, and you know the biggest conflict socially is about what do we do with these people who were not part of the human uh, or the um, you know uh, American social structure. These people who's domination allowed capitalism to flourish, what are we going to do now that they have the ability to assert themselves? Because now they do have, you know, been turned into citizens in all but name and that they have been turned into capitalist subjects. And that means that they are able to assert their own interests. And that creates this conflict. But within the, like, the, the greater uh, cocoon of, you know, uh, American identity, the 50s uh, are this era of, of humming social concord. Profits go up for businesses, that means, or profits go up for corporations, that means uh, benefits go up for uh, workers. But in the 60s, oh my God, this conflict is now heating up because the complacent whites are giving birth to a bunch of fucking kids who aren't complacent. They don't take, they take for granted the conditions that that generation, the greatest generation, took as a miracle. That, 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 uh, that Levittown house with the fucking quarter acre that the veterans of World War II got, at, the white veterans of World War II got after uh, getting out of the military was literally a social Valhalla, a realized, immunitized Valhalla for the people who had suffered through the Great Depression and World War II. Like, like nobody who fought in World War II had not experienced the Great Depression, which meant... That many of them had been had grown up in conditions of just apocalyptic poverty, uh, and 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 similarly apocalyptic social crisis, and then they fought a fucking war. They went somewhere. They shot someone. They saw people shot. You get up. You come home, and it's like no more violence. No more destabilization. Now. You can consume your way to heaven. Now, of course, none of them would be able to. They'd all be miserable eventually. But at the time, it is a incredibly persuasive offer. And it's a social lubricant. Europe needed way more because their society had been more deeply traumatized by the war than ours. But by the mid-60s, this social concord is breaking down because the racial basis that it required is breaking down. And this is happening socially at the same time that those European and pretty soon now Japanese economies are manufacturing at a level uh, uh, equal to the United States, pulling down the rate of profit that everything had depended on. So that's where inflation whoosh, starts kicking into the system. This is the smoke turning into flames. Like a five, a five, like... Inflation is always just like, it's, it's this Kindle, right? Because it's, it's the inevitable and constant uh, class conflict that defines society. But it's, uh, its expression can be like a low, manageable level, or it can be spikes of like significant social violence. And, uh, and, uh, and this is very important at this point, not now anymore, but I mean increasingly, 
uh, labor activity, fucking strikes, militant, militant uh, unionism. Because while this is happening, profits are going down. Oh, what's this? They can't take it out of labor because everybody's got a union and nobody's going to sign off on uh, having their pay checks cut because they're still working for a living and they want to be compensated for it. And that is why the, tr this, the vision that I think people like Keynes and FDR had is that the, eventually it would be unarguable to anyone who is rational that the only way to bring about a stable social order, the thing that we all purport to want, and the kind of social advancement that we all purport to want, is to what, do what Keynes said and euthanize the rentier class, right? Uh, eventually reform, uh, take over capitalism from within. Have, so, have government organs controlled by like a democratic system slowly but surely uh, eat the heart out of capitalism uh, without having to go uh, through with a cop cataclysmic class war. And of course, like, it was very persuasive when you're you know, sitting in an office, when you aren't a worker, when every day is not alienated from you. It's very easy to say, this is the best possible option because it discounts the real daily alienation of being a worker and, what the, and how it compounds through your social life. It's imagined from a position of bourgeois complacency. But again, you can't blame people. Everyone who's going to rise to a position within these systems is going to have that uh, belief. If they didn't, they wouldn't be there. And that belief is self-motivated, but all of ours are. So you have this full employment economy uh, that empowers workers. Full employment creates inflation, and then the empowered workers deny the ability of capital to take that inflation out of the hide of labor, which it has to do, or otherwise it takes it out of capital, because there's only two places for it to go. Inflation enters the system to keep profit in under capitalism to keep profits up. As a, as a, like, uh, a defense mechanism of, of the profit sector. Because what I think guys like FDR and Keynes would have hoped is, is that by the 70s, by the 60s and 70s, by this point, the leaders of the advanced countries would have been so rational, so committed to uh, reality, that they would have recognized that the only way to deal with this crisis, this fundamental contradiction at the heart of global capitalism, is to effect a slow and steady climb down of capital, personified by something like the Meidner Plan in Sweden. And of course, Sweden, like one of the most advanced of the social democracies, generates the closest thing to an actual policy that could have been an alternative to what we got in the 70s. And that is this plan to by, uh, have, by law, a certain percentage of shares of all public stock to be held by the government. Uh, or no, not the government, the labor union. I'm sorry. The union would be guaranteed as part of their compensation uh, and, and the, you know, their treaty with, with capital a, a certain percentage of stock that would increase over years. So eventually they would have a majority stake and therefore administrative control of the means of production. This is, this is the fantasy they had. And we, the closest we got was an articulation of it. In the minor plan, also the British Labor Party, which was still very radical in the early 70s, had, as they saw this coming, developed uh, a alternative, which we'll talk about, uh, about the next chap in the next chapter. But in the real heart of hearts in America, where it mattered, there was nobody to be found who had that kind of vision. The closest thing you'd have is like a Nixon, but the problem with Nixon is, is at the end of the day, he was more than anything, middle class. If you wanted to find Nixon's essential character, it is not even as an American, it is as a middle class, uh, uh, a middle class striver. That is what defined him. And so his ambitions were the ambitions of the middle class. So he could never have uh, effectively allied or affected a uh, working class led uh, march towards socialism. He would have smashed this thing up before that. I mean, we saw, even in the conditions that he did have, where he was really battling only against 
capital and not against labor, really. They've been neutralized. Uh, he still got fucking owned. Because, like, what, what Nixon really wanted to do was, like, step down, but on American terms, which is only ever going to lead, even if he wouldn't have thought so, only ever going to lead to fascism again. Because you can't have a national capitalism. Not at this stage of development. You cannot have a national capitalism under conditions of this much accumulated technological uh, power. This much force multiplying of like human kinetic energy. In a nuclear age, you cannot have national capitalism. Certainly not at the scale of consumption that the United States requires, even if it was like in barracks conditions. I mean, you look at Nixon's upbringing, the son of a fucking bitter, a guy, who, a failed farmer, somebody who had tried to grasp the Yomian dream, had it taken from him, and then forced to do the shadow version, the pathetic uh, play version of Yeoman self-sufficiency, a business owner. Like now, our, our business owners, they can only, they associate, you know, their uh, Yeoman autonomy only like through the lens of history. It's all, it's all just on their terms. But a guy like uh, Nixon's dad, uh, fuck, I forgot his first name. Uh, somebody tell me his first name. Uh, but a guy like Nixon's dad had had it and seen it, go, seen it fall through his fingers. And then he, had a, he, had, he owned a grocery store. But it's like, okay, great. You know, he doesn't have a boss. But now... He's fucking selling other people's food. He cannot, he's not making his own. He's not sustaining himself. France, Francis? He is dependent on the market. He is dependent on suppliers. He's, he has a relationship with employees. He's on this knife edge at all times. And then Nixon grew up with that. And then he shows up as one of the bright boys at the exact moment all the other best and brightest emerge, right? The people, the generation who would cause the Vietnam War and then uh, build the neoliberal engine of death that we all live with. These guys. Uh, they all had that moment, right? Go, going to college, uh, get, turning into men just as World War II happens. And he can't go to an Ivy League school. He has to go to his, his local college, Whittier. And it's very funny because he is in many ways like a mirror image of Johnson. And they are very, in a lot of, they are the most, they're the two most interesting, in my mind, psychologically, presidents we've had. They're two of the most uh, uh, erratic psychos we've ever had to be president. The fact that we survived them both being in charge of the nuclear button is an, honestly a miracle. And they both came from backgrounds where their landowning father had lost it all and, and uh, then had to struggle for something else. The difference is, is that Francis Nixon's milieu was business and uh, Johnson's was government because his dad had been a prominent member of the state Senate, state legislature. And so there was a certain uh, government becomes like this, uh, uh, this trusted institution from a young age uh, and a viable ladder of, of uh, advancement. Nixon comes to politics because like, he's a megalomaniac, but from the outside, having been alienated from it his whole life. Um, but anyway. What this, the, the gist of all of this is that the people in the rooms making these decisions now, capitalism has so fully determined every one of the, the subsequent like uh, rungs of control that they might be in charge of. Uh, that there is no longer any Jenga tile that they can pull without causing a huge rupture in the global capitalist political economy. 
Because if you did expropriate capital to deal with this crisis, they would fight back everywhere. And the thing is, is that even the Labour Party politicians who are in charge in the social democratic parties of Europe and even the Euro communists, they fundamentally have a aligned class interest with capitalism to avoid a final rupture. And that is the problem. That's why, really, you have to have a political organization. You have to build structures of power. It's in, it's, you cannot not do it. It's the only way to have people organize sufficiently to address crisis and provoke moments of rupture. But at those grass, those grassroots had been killed. They had been killed by the, the fucking, uh, the roundup of post-war, uh, post-war, uh, it, imperial capital surplus and the mass expropriation and immiseration of the global south. You can't unring that bell in 1974, right? You can't say, hey, uh, we're from the middle of, the, of capitalism and we, uh, it's all not working, so we're going we're gonna to get rid of it. Hey, no hard feelings, you guys, right? No, there's now this, in, uh, this, this uh, fundamental alienation between periphery and center, at every level, this guilt and, and resentment and, and shame that can't be addressed, uh, and that and that social peace in the middle of the in the core is built on. I am looking at the chat when I look, yes. So, uh, I've, this has been a long, I'm still barely getting into introducing into this stupid chapter, but, uh, okay, you have this inflation crisis begin in the mid-50s. At the exact peak of profits, you have this inflation start to kick in, and then profits start to collapse, and that drives uh, this, uh, this new crisis at the, uh, that eventually manifests in the, uh, the monetary system. There aren't enough U.S. dollars anymore to go around. If they keep printing more of them, inflation will increase. So they have to, uh, once again, they don't have to do this. They could expropriate banks. They could nationalize. They just cannot realistically do it. So that means there has to be a, a re, re, restructuring of this thing. But how is it going to go? Where is it going to come from? And, 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 these, and uh, Pandich say, once again, it begins in the halls of American state power, where you first see uh, this uh, uh, addressing the, the, the beginning of like an articulation of a new way forward that then gets pushed through the whole global system to break up that... Uh, a global New Deal order and turn it into something liberalized. Uh, one of the first big things that does that is that uh, one of the contributors to uh, volatility in the global market is that uh, ethnic uh, is that economic nationalism in the former colonial world is at its all time high, and that means expropriation of uh, of foreign investment is at an all time high, and. The World Bank emerges as an institution uh, devoted to arbitrating at a allegedly, fit, like, uh, impersonal, like, uh, disinterest. It, it basically uh, it introduces itself as a global court for disputes between states and uh, private or uh, foreign investors. And of course, this is a sham. You know, this is like international law in any other instance. This is a thing weighted towards the interests of the foreign investors. It's designed to help them. It's designed only to pacify uh, the, the given 
state if it's not powerful enough to assert its will. And this is the model uh, that is going to be used to break up and destroy these little nodes of economic nationalism uh, in the uh, 80s and 90s. It's like uh, when they use the the it's when they use the sound waves to break up kidney stones. They're going to use uh, these informal institutions of, of adjudication, like the World Bank, to impose new liberalized uh, financial uh, and capital markets on these countries. In the face of popular demands for nationalization, this is all about preventing actual democracy from ever, act, from ever threatening the system. That's what this entire process is. Uh, and part of this is keeping the damn Brits happy. So the U.S. allows, through a loophole, uh, this back door uh, uh, into the Bank of London, which, you know, we have a special relationship with England. Given what happened to their economy uh, after the war, they honestly should have been completely destroyed. Uh, but we kept them up because of the special relationship and because of the necessity of the old structures of uh, global finance that the bank, that the uh, British had built. And part of that is the pound, the bloody pound sterling, which we kept along, limping along as a, as a strong currency. Uh, it didn't get devalued like the lira or something, even though it probably should have. Um, and, and, and another thing we gave them to help prop them up is this... Uh, this clearinghouse for U.S. dollars that, uh, that uh, circumvents the fixed exchange system called the euro dollar market. Uh, and what this does is it allows American banks to avoid the regulations limiting interest rates that were imposed uh, after the uh, great crash of 29 uh, by put, going out and get an, uh, uh, exchanging on this uh, dollar uh, in this dollar market. And at the same time, this makes uh, US bonds very attractive. So uh, a ton of uh, capital, US capital floods into Europe. Commercial banks are offering uh, securities like CDs so that you're no longer just having your money invested in some sort of thing, you're purchasing financial instruments, which is, that's, that's a new, that's, that's blurring the lines that Class Steagall were supposed to build between uh, finance institutions and, uh, you know, uh, commercial banks for regular people to put their money in. Uh, and th that money is getting added at this point by pensions. Because one of the things that uh, these militant workers are able to wring out of capital is these huge pension contributions that then have to get put somewhere. And they get invested into these markets too. So workers are getting, uh, becoming part of uh, the capital uh, market and benefiting from it. This is the kind of stuff. These are the Jenga pieces that can't be pulled away once the crisis gets deeper. Because you have these institutions that are... Uh, Uh, that are disconnected fundamentally from uh, from militancy, like uh, because that militancy has been diffused and redirected, and and uh, abstracted, and alienated by all of the uh, realities of society in a context of uh, class conflict being sublimated into consumption. That increases the importance of culture. It, it makes culture bigger and more powerful and a bigger uh, factor in sustaining capitalism than it had been before. Because one of the key things keeping people from acting like workers is that they have so much of their time invested in these pursuits of identity formation that are outside of their, uh, their conditions as workers, but are in fact instead defined as their positions as consumers. A consumer-based economy means people are going to consume more. They're going to spend more of their time consuming. It is going to do more to, fill, to shape their conscious sense of self than the hours they spend working are.
And when that, and so that means is that when the crisis happens, people are, they're trusting of their labor union. They're trusting of their vote. Maybe they're losing that trust, but not enough to do anything effectively because those social bonds that would have allowed them to do something else, they're gone. There is a big strike wave during this period. There's a big mass, in the early 70s rather, as this is getting worse, there's a huge strike wave in the United States uh, that rivals in numbers the strike wave of the uh, late 40s after World War II. Uh, but this is like a rear guard action. This is like the, the dying flash of like the remaining class solidarity that existed among workers who, uh, as I said, didn't take for granted uh, consumption in exchange for exploitation because they didn't live through World War I or World War II and the Great Depression. They took for granted that level of uh, that social conflict compact. They wanted to push beyond it. Everyone wants to push beyond. Every human wants to push beyond. It's, it's absurd not to want to. What the capitalism had given them is 20 years where they got to push around. And now, a time when crisis had emerged and we could no longer sustain the fantasy of reform, the revolutionary impulse has been totally abs uh, diffused. Culturally. Culturally defused. Not diffused. Defused. Part of this, by the way, is a generation of regulators and bankers who fill these institutions who are not wedded to uh, the Keynesian deal and, and uh, the, uh, the administrative state. They don't feel like, they don't imagine it as, they don't have the relationship of like, this is the life raft that saved humanity. Like we were going to be swallowed by darkness. The globe was going to be a charnel house. And this thing, this, this structure, this American capitalist uh, uh, Keynesian state saved us. So they had a they had a real like existential loyalty to it that younger people at every level, like the, the young rebels who actually did want to fight the state but had no class vocabulary to organize their discontent and therefore saw it diffused. So this strike wave is part of that. But it's wild it's and it's largely wildcat strikes in opposition to complacent management that was willing to sign the death treaty or the death certificate of the working class in America because it meant they get to stay in a union office instead of on the line. It comes down to that, I believe. They take for granted at every level, the labor union organizers, the, the politicians at every level at this point, that their personal interest and the best interest of all are identical. And you can't disabuse them of that because it is, it is a motivated reasoning that goes beyond rationality, which is why we never got the FDR uh, Keynesian fantasy of the, this being the moment when, okay, capital, give it up. Because if capital gives it up, then the imperial core has to give it up. Again, not all at once and not catastrophically because the whole idea is you... you, uh, you adjust as things change, you know? You build as the, the ground shifts. You don't force anything. Uh, but in a way that takes, tells people who have lost their class solidarity, lost their uh, understanding of themselves as any kind of international project, to give up control of their lives, uh, the prospect of like continued material uh, advancement, but doesn't give up but doesn't uh, immediately alleviate uh, alienation and exploitation either. That's a tall order. And the thing is that it was so thoroughly tall that by the time the moment came, there was almost nobody there to really articulate it. The alternative never materialized. All we got was this internal reform towards uh, terminal capitalism. Like, this is late capitalism in the sense that it is locking in a political economy that is in self-conscious conflict. Like, the people building it know with the resources that sustain it. Like, the previous generation could believe that eternal growth was possible. Now, you can say that's silly. It doesn't make sense mathematically. But 
look what they had seen in their lifetime. It's that trajectory. It's the experience of a trajectory that gives it that feeling. That had stalled out, though, and these guys knew. They all knew it was coming. And that is why what we're going to be talking about about these chapters is this system is basically readjusted so that all of the capital can just let her rip. And that is, every one of these guys will know, uh, you know, going to destabilize all of the structures that had sustained it until this point. Uh, but the reason they do it more than anything is because they don't believe that there is an alternative. Because in their mind, there isn't. That area has been foreclosed. The alternative is a apocalypse because they cannot conceive of a utopia. That's, what's, that's the part of their brain that's been soldered off by their exposure, their day-to-day -day exposure as a like prime mover in a capitalist uh, organ. That there is that this is the only world that it can be. That we are not enforcing a uh, a democratic co coordination of resources. We are enforcing a transcendent law. I think that's what it boils down to. These people had emerged by this point, convinced at an atomic level, to the point that the only thing that was ever going to beat them was a revolutionary confrontation with people who did not have that programming, which we didn't get. And you might say, well, that's good because that would have been a nuclear war. And it's like, yeah, you could argue that as soon as the atomic bomb is developed, that the class war is over. And it's just, like you could say Skynet went self-aware at the Trinity test. Because there can be no real confrontation between capital and labor of the, of the size sufficient to reorientate this machine away from inevitable extinction. That will not trigger an instantaneous extinction. The activation of the death drive that lies dormant in the heart of capitalism under any conditions and then uh, goes into overdrive in uh, terminal conditions like the fascist states of, uh, of, mid, of uh, the 30s in Europe, in Japan. So first, uh, LBJ tries to deal with this inflationary crisis by uh, imposing limits on capital outflows in 1968. Uh, and then, even and Nixon gets elected. He doesn't change that. He keeps that in, in force, showing his that he said, as he said, we're all Keynesians now. Uh, and then in 1971, they close the gold window. They say the U.S. dollar is no longer convertible to gold, and that means no more fixed exchange rates. Now, and ever since, uh, the exchange rate floats. You go to the board, and there's a different. Uh, you're going to get a different number depending on how their markets are doing, depending on how much capital is flowing into versus out of their economies. Uh, and this is wildly destabilizing, obviously. Uh, but it allows the United States to keep foreign capital coming in, which it needs to, for, to uh, activate one end of the global uh, uh, supply circuit, while also exporting capital, which it still has to do. So the only way to do that is to unpeg the gold standard and basically print more money. Going to have to do it. Uh, but that means that to stop that inflation we were talking about, without gold there, the U.S. dollar is going to have to be kept below a certain level of inflation. More, most importantly, inflation... Uh, on the dollar has to stay lower than other countries that we're trading with. They're allowed to flow to higher uh, uh, inflation. The U.S. can't because we are the we're the the stone weighing the whole thing down. Like, and that ha that's imposed by that's an artificial imposition. Like, that's what I'm saying. These people think that that is God they're serving. They think that that that, that like that that vestigial relationship between value and like uh, and, and a natural object 
is their residual belief in the transcendental nature of capitalism. Transcendental nature of capitalism. Because you want to know why the Cold War didn't end in a nuclear war? Because the Soviets would never have done it. We would have done it. The Soviets would never have started a nuclear war. When you read about how Khrushchev was uh, reacted to the news that the, 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 that the, the USSR had, launched, had tested their first nuke successfully, he was... He, was, he got drunk for like a week, I believe, is what happened. Like, he was horrified by the, the prospect of that sort of global uh, uh, apocalypse, just wiping out the entire project of human you know, civilization. Uh, the, 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 and that's why when the Soviet system came into terminal crisis, did they launch the nukes? No. But if this system goes into a similar crisis, will, will there be a launching of nukes absolutely and so the question becomes and it's going to only be answered by the end of the 70s by the Volcker uh, interest rate hike at the Fed uh, that the US is going to break labor to make this happen and that's the project that's the federal government's project of this during this crisis period starting specifically in the 70s uh, is to break labor domestically and abroad through all of its uh, levers of power over, you know, military, uh, uh, espionage and, and, and deep state uh, intelligence structures, uh, uh, politics, uh, and uh, monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening here, is that this, the 70s is a long buck-breaking. And these chapters talk about the, the buck-breaking of the, uh, the international left. Uh, and then the next one will be about the, the final buck-breaking of the American uh, left. And I, I mean broadly, electoral left, which, you know, your combination of, uh, of students and uh, radicals, and, uh, but also the, the, lo the closest thing to a social democratic party that exists, uh, and the organs of the trade unions of the, of the, of the working class. So, um, okay, so that's chapter five. So this is what's happening. How are we going to buck break the left, uh, the working class? Uh, and chapter six, structural power through crisis shows how uh, this is starting to come into focus. So we've got this situation here where uh, the contradictions of managing an, a, a inherently in, and immovably in, inegalitarian social order are uh, just multiplying. The third world, they're expropriating. Profit, this is the important part, this is the thing. Profit on manufacturing in the United States declines 40% from 1965 to 70. This is after it had just been going up, 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 and then had had just a supernova in the mid-60s to just collapse pretty much overnight. Uh, and this is, this starts all the bells and whistles. This starts the whole machine to start to shudder in every institution, uh, in every level of the political economy. Uh, Now, companies respond by uh, investing. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, we're not making this much money? Well, we need to be more productive. So how do you be more productive? Well, you invest in ways to increase efficiency. And they did the thing, but the, product, the, uh, the investment did not produce a rise in uh, productivity that could reverse this trend. Uh, and one of the things that stood in the way, this is one of these contradictions, these fundamental contradictions, it's in the best interest of the workers for the profits to rise, right? Because then they get more of the profits. But in the face, in a situation of declining profits, uh, a company is going to try to increase productivity by increasing efficiency. But increasing efficiency increases alienation and exploitation of workers. 
which have been set at a, at a certain tolerable level under certain conditions of consumption. Now those conditions of consumption, thanks to inflation, are being destabilized. And now the companies are asking them to self-exploit. And they, because they have militancy, because they have strong unions, resist. Part of this wave of wildcats you got. Uh, and also, the other thing you can do if you want to reclaim profits, if you can't get more efficiency, is you reclaim it from labor. But that also is prevented by the unions. So the, the companies are basically stuck now in this situation. And it's often blamed on the workers, right? Like, that's the right-wing argument about this. Is it was the greedy workers who led to this. It's like, no, the workers were just doing what they were, uh, was in their best interest, their self-interest uh, in any way that you can express it. They were looking after their position within the company in the, their relationship to capital. It, the labor union movement was doing what it was supposed to. It just wasn't, it wasn't doing it uh, with sufficient militancy to uh, you know, maybe win a confrontation. Instead, it negotiated its way to annihilation. So you start to see bank failures now, uh, and, and big companies start going under. There's this uh, Penn Central Corporation, one of the sixth biggest company in America. It fucking uh, collapses. The U.S., uh, Nixon tries to back it out, back to bail it out, and uh, Congress says no dice because that would be interfering in the economy. Uh, and this is when the Fed, in the face of this inflation, instead of cutting rates, uh, or instead of increasing rates, cuts them. And a lot of people blame... Uh, FDR or blame Nixon for doing this to try to get reelected cynically in 1972, but it was really about pumping liquidity into the economy to prevent that collapse from triggering a general uh, uh, crisis. So this is when the Fed starts its policy of injecting liquidity to uh, prevent a domino of uh, bankruptcies. Uh, and this becomes their remit. This is what they do for the rest of uh, uh, until now, like that's been their only button to press. Uh, that is why we were having such an interesting crisis now, because, you know, by that token, they should be, uh, you know, tamping on interest, tamping on the interest rate thing. But if they do it too hard, they really do risk triggering something that they have no other response to, a terminal crisis, and they don't want that either. So that's why it just seems like nobody has any idea what the fuck to do. And this, there was a similar feeling during this period because nobody could conceive of doing what ended up happening to the working class of this country. But what they didn't realize is how it would happen, how the, the pain would be disproportionately felt by people who lived uh, in urban areas, people who did not access the homeowning bonanza of the post-war world, who did not get a cut chuck of equity and therefore an interest in capitalism and in markets, who got no... Uh, equity in the American project, basically. Uh, they were not stockholders. They're, of course, disproportionately racial minorities, which means their pain is filtered only, you know, kind of peripherally into the political structure. Uh, a political uh, body is happy to kind of sacrifice these people, which they did to the war on drugs. And that meant that, and then you've got within, you know, the, 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 the white racial category, you still have, uh, you might have people who are, you know, uh, all homeowners, but some of them are going to be members of uh, professions that are going to keep expanding in uh, income and stuff, and others are going to totally stultify. And then over time, they're going to be owned by it, but they're going to be owned by themselves, they're going to be owned in isolation. They're not going to feel it as, as the state, as the capitalist order uh, dominating them. It's going to feel like a, a collection of small personal failures because that's how, the only way that they have been told to understand their lives. They are not a part of anything. They are an individual. And their rising and falling is their own responsibility. And so... This stuff that, like, taken as one hammer blow is inconceivable becomes over time possible as these reforms just sink into the system and allow each crisis to more disproportionately uh, send its greatest misery to its most disempowered 
portions. And of course, like, yeah, inflation is bad, but it's made much worse by the fact that it's the only way to talk about uh, the economy like in a grand structural sense. And it's in, in, inherently invested with a reactionary framework. Because remember, this is this, the, the, the inflation of money, right? This is the real fire of class conflict. This is the, the, the friction turning into flame. And we can only see from the, the shadow in Plato's cave the words inflation, as there, as though there is a, a economy that is separate from our will, which is the grand mystification of capitalism, and the reason it can never be reformed from within. But the real way that they try to get Nixon reelected is to dump a ton of money into the mortgage system. So they, there's this crisis of, uh, of, of wages. They can't really give any more money to workers directly, but they can get more of them into houses, ones who were missed by the, first, the last waves of, uh, of, of home ownership. But of course, they can't just be directly given the way that GI uh, Bill uh, had given like college educations and, uh, and government mortgages, uh, they had to put it out into this new burgeoning finance uh, capital market. Fannie Mae starts ma selling mortgage-backed securities. This is where mortgage-backed securities begin, and it is a way to dump liquidity at the bottom of the U.S. Uh, consumer pyramid, near the bottom anyway, nearer to the bottom than before, to get some more consumption into the goddamn thing. And this begins the, the paradigm we're stuck with now, which is liquidity being pumped in. Uh, only now, it only gets pumped in at the top. We've even lost, post-2008, uh, the ability to pump it in at the bottom at all. The closest thing we had were the, uh, were the very measly... Uh, uh, stimulus checks of the late Trump and Biden, early Biden years, which did, you know, uh, help salvage things, but, you know, also contributed in some way to this new, new normal of inflation, which I really think is best understood as just this expression of a, of a class system that is screaming under pressure. But of course, we can't talk about it in those terms. We have to talk about it in terms of this this, this God that has to be appeased with sacrifice, which is, this is, that is the religion that we're being fed. This is a Mesoamerican fucking uh, noble class structure, basically, being imposed on us. People are going to have to be sacrificed, literally, uh, to the God of inflation, because it is immoral to expropriate from capital. Because unlike every other part of life, every other human relationship, the uh, relationship between a owner of capital and his capital, a totally fictitious arrangement, transcends all human values. Now, part of the reason that we're stuck with this is because one, there was one last trick that the Keynesians could pull here. There was one last Keynesian button to press, and in 1971, Nixon pressed it which were wage and price controls. This is it. Just the government saying, you're not getting any more money, but things aren't going to cost anymore. Because one of the big things is driving increased uh, pay packets for workers is that they had to keep ahead of inflation. But of course, that helped drive inflation. I know that the MMTers are screaming, no, 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 that didn't do anything. I get it. You're talking about what is in some metaphysical fucking world. Yes, we hypothetically could do anything with anything. But as I was saying, by this point, we have reified institutions that hold real power and that cannot just be assumed away magically. So your analysis is essentially beside the point. It's very, the same thing is true of Georgism with the single tax. Yeah, you're right. But who cares? The rightness of it will not make it win. 
That was the dream of fucking uh, FDR and fucking Keynes and all these liberals. And it's the last dream of the socialist liberal, which is a pure strain breed of like American uh, goody goody. God bless them. They're, they're in, in many cases, they're allies of the working class. Hell, I'd probably count as one in some respect. But at the end of the day, they want to, con they want to avoid the class conflict because it seems to them more traumatic than the status quo, which is, of course, that's, that's the lie, right? Is that the pain and misery and horror of this system is somehow acceptable. That this is okay, because it is. Regrettable, sad, should, we should do something about it, but as a baseline, it's something that we can live with. And we do, we literally do. And one of the reasons we do is because everybody else does. And we can't really do anything about that. But what we can do is not pretend like our uh, politics should reflect that. Like even just the way we frame things, I don't know. Again, like I get wanting to like try to clear people's minds of, of the mystifications, but if you accept that this, sus this system can be democratically administered, which is what MMT presupposes, then you are assuming a uh, fundamentally contradictory being. You are, you are summoning a, a, um, an oxymoron into being. And at first, business actually welcomes raising price controls. Uh, labor does too, although they start pointing out, hey, you know, those, uh, those wages, they're, they're getting clamped down a lot, a lot harder by the regulators than those prices are. Uh, and of course, that was true. Uh, but eventually, it just became too unwieldy as, as the need to speed things up increased. They had to jack more into this. They had to keep the circulation uh, speeding up to, to compensate for the general... Uh, the stall. They had to start commercializing non-commercial parts of uh, the economy. They had to start de-democratizing, basically, the economy in order to get it to run faster and more efficiently, while also eating away at the necessary organs that keep capitalism going. So we got a floating exchange rate here, embraced by Washington, but they had to pitch it to the rest of the world. People were terrified of getting off gold because these are all capitalists. They all want to maintain capitalism and they're all terrified of losing that uh, organizing principle of the global economy, that, that regulator. And uh, part, of the, part of the job of pitching it is telling them like this is going to come with greater freedom of your financial markets. Uh, and that becomes the, the, the carrot that gets them to go along with it. Uh, and meanwhile, this is like restructuring all of the global markets. And it's also doing so while reinforcing U.S. power. Because now it's, it's just straight our currency uh, that is going to be determining uh, like these global trends. And the tech sector uh, is a big part of that. Like the U.S. has a huge... Uh, leaps forward in computer technology in the 70s. And the reason it's the United States is because the U.S. built a military industrial state after the war. They didn't spend their money on fucking social housing and making sure people had 30-day work weeks. They spent it on a military industrial machine that spent an incredible amount of money on pure research that had huge, that could not have been produced in the private sector because of the need to make money in the immediate uh, future. And that meant that you had these huge government-funded innovations that occurred in the uh, 70s. Once again, this is all stuff that could have been taken by a uh, socialist governing structure and put to the job of networking the global economy 
and getting rid of the need for the private sector, getting rid of the need for the the capitalist class to organize the social order, get in, get away for the need for class exploitation. And this is the kind of thing that Chile was was experimenting with with cyber sin. And of course, we made sure that Pinochet's guys, goons, went in there and machine gunned the whole thing. In the U.S., we made these huge advancements, but they were put to private use. They were put to the use of bolstering the, 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 uh, the private economy. Uh, there's an interesting part in this chapter where uh, Bill Casey, who uh, conspiracy heads might recognize as uh, Reagan's CIA chief, the guy who did all, who created like a completely unaccountable uh, shadow government that did Iran-Contra and the October Surprise and basically reacted to the Church Committee uh, and Watergate by just building a secondary uh, layer of uh, distance from accountability from like the real arm of state policy. Uh, in this period, he is an undersecretary of state, and he writes about how, to people who are skittish about this new reality that is going to mean, you know, uh, uh, this new reality that's, oh, we're opening up the global economy, we're putting the U.S., we're going to float the dollar at the same time that our manufacturing profits are fucking just skidding down a hill. Uh, Casey writes, it's going to be okay. This is going to strengthen America because America, uh, it doesn't have to export uh, goods anymore, it can export securities. We can take this huge uh, f uh, finance, uh, 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 this huge capital uh, market in the U.S. and throughout every level of it, securitize it by getting rid of those New Deal era regulations that prevent that kind of speculative work. And this is, this is literally speeding up the economy to make up for its longitudinal decline. We're going, okay, we can't circulate at the level of products. We can circulate at the level of these fictitious derivatives that are referring to value in the future. And this means that the SEC gets uh, buck broken and turned uh, it, it, its ability to actually oversee, uh, you know, any real, uh, with any, with any real, uh, you know, power, that's gone. Uh And uh, banks start sending out CDs, so they're turning into, uh, they're securitizing. We got these mortgage-backed securities I just talked about. We have this new uh, thing we can sell, a new way to circulate the currency. And of course, it's not based on real value. It's based on speculative value. We're, we're, we are multiplying, we're creating multipliers for a real economy that is no longer profitable in the long term. Now, that should tell you you have to readjust things. Maybe get rid of profit. Maybe socially determine so that you're going to have conflict. You're going to have violence. You're going to have probably state-by-state -state warfare. But you're going to have a general trend towards uh, an equilibrium being reached. Uh, where you get rid of the, the downward spiral uh, of capitalist cyclical crisis. But as I said, there's nobody there to argue for that. Uh, so instead, what we get is this newly securitized economy uh, that can that makes value out of thin air. Uh, and in the mid '70s, you see bank collapses. There's a San Diego bank that collapses. There's a big German bank that collapses. And this is when the government starts stepping in, without really anybody knowing it. Certainly not with any deliberation uh, in in public, and starts uh, stepping into backstop these collapses and this is the real uh pact of neoliberalism the only only half of this gets told you get told that oh yeah the 70s was this neoliberalization period period when all these regulatory structures were relieved and the government's hand in the market was reduced and that's half the story but the other side is that at the very same time because of the way that the the uh, central banks respond to these bank collapses, you're seeing a pattern established where uh, this new order that's going to be less publicly regulated is going to be subject to more uh, frequent and more responsive state intervention in the form of bailouts, in the form of liquidity. 
So the only way to sustain this newly volatile speculative economy is to guarantee that none of the crises that provo are provoked by it terminally cascade through the system. It's a failsafe. But it is government intervention. So the government is still there, which is why most of the discussions of neoliberalism that sort of make it about making the state invisible are telling only the public-facing story, the story that these guys tell themselves. In reality, it is just refiguring the state to be less democratically accountable. It is getting rid of any actual public influence on what this state, which is capital and the, uh, and the, the government, is going to do. And the real showcase for this new regime that is going to redefine the, the, uh, the political economy of every country along these new lines is in Britain, which is the first European country to get the, uh, the Ned Beatty network treatment, which is totally makes sense because no country in Europe had a more delusional relationship with its own uh, economy than the UK did, and that's for very good reasons. Like I said, they were our uh, our older uncle. They they were they, that's that's our uncle. That's our and the uncle magic between the U.S. and Britain is unchallenged in the world, even though we fought early on. Uh, you know, we took over their global uh, economic order. You know, we have an intermeshed ruling class. So that means that we're not going to let them turn into, uh, like, fucking Greece after World War II. We're not going to let them languish. And, of course, because they're a super industrialized state, their working class won't let them languish. The working class would have organized politically to prevent that because they were... This is the first working class in the world. Yes, they've been pacified by, you know, Britain's imperial plunder and it's the legends it tells itself, but they still had... Much, a lot of capacity in the 50s. Or, uh, and so the sterling got buoyed by the U.S. Uh, they got to have their overvalued currency and pretend to be one of the big boy economies. Uh, now they had to go, and even then they had to do austerity in the 50s. But then they got to go along, they got to get the tail, tail end of, uh, of the 60s boom. But by the early 70s, it's already falling apart. Because as soon as the U.S. can no longer hold that center with the gold standard, the whole, and you get that floating exchange rate, sterling is doomed. Because the, the, the economy cannot, the economy is not productive enough to pay, in the capitalist sense, to pay for the level of social expenditure that they had settled on after the war. Can't do it. So now you have a, a labor government which had a Meidner plan-esque radical plan it's, that its delegates supported, Tony Benn initiated, to take control of the banking sector, to, to do it, to do the thing that the fucking, uh, that the labor parties of Europe had always implicitly promised to do at the day of, at the, on the day of judgment. Okay, we're here. This is it. It's us or them. We're going to take control of this thing. And that's how they got elected. But then, Callaghan, he gets his Ned Beatty speech. And the U.S. leans on him hard. And the mechanism they used to do it is an IFM law, an IMF loan. Now, this is going to be how they buck break the rest of the world, and it starts in Britain. The IMF, this, in, this instrument of U.S. capital offers a loan to deal with the massive uh, currency crisis occurring in Britain because of their balance of trade, because of their deficit. They will offer them a sweetheart loan that gets them off the hook economically in exchange for austerity, in exchange for changing the social contract between the British public and their government. And that labor government, they fought it a little bit, their delegates pitched a fit, but at the end of the day, they took the deal. Because to them, the alternative, and this is it, they honestly believed the alternative was an economic collapse that would have destroyed Britain. 
because they could not imagine that kind of crisis resulting in uh, the working class taking power. They couldn't imagine it. It was outside of their minds. That lobe, that utopian lobe had been spot welded shut by the experience of being a labor politician and by, by being uh, a top labor union guys. And this is exactly what ended up happening in Greece. When Shariza gets elected to say to, to tell the Germans to fuck off, and then they get another fucking uh, show of uh, affirmation uh, in a, in the referendum, and then the Germans don't blink, and then they have to they, they have to sh uh, shut up pitch up uh, they have to <clears throat> they have to shut up shop they have to just pitch the tents they have to piss on the fire and call in the dogs in the face of what the people were telling them to do because they did not have it. They didn't have a plan. Varoufakis claims he had a plan, but none of them had the will to carry it out because they were too scared of rupture. They were too frightened of apocalypse. But the fact is, is that if, if you are a utopian, which all socialists should be because it is the social consummation of the Christian uh, teleos, then you should say that we, something can come out of this. The con because I'm not saying, oh, this would have been like a nuclear war, some Podemo bullshit, or I'm sorry, Posadist bullshit, or like, oh yeah, this would have been epic red terror in the streets, and they all would have been like living in a miserable uh, Maoist, or no, they would have like basically been, it would have been turning uh, Britain into uh, the Khmer Rouge Cambodia, but that's okay because it's based. And they killed all those pedophile uh, ruling class scumbags. It's based. I'm not saying that. The conflict would not necessarily have been totally uh, uh, destructive, but it sure as shit would not have allowed guys like James Callahan to be fucking prime minister of Britain. It wouldn't allow him to tool around fucking Downing Street in his little car or any of the people in, uh, in, throughout the bureaucratic and political structures of the British state, no matter what party they were alleged to serve. They wouldn't be able to stay there. Yeah, like, I, I always think that with Varoufakis, like, he had an idea, but that's all it was. And it's like, you needed to have way more planning and way more of a network and way more institutional uh, buy-in to make that happen. And you really do have to say that, like, if that was the case, then there should have been some attempt by somebody to tie the referendum to a specific course of action. Not just know and then see what happens. Because what Shariza was doing was, again, how this is a mirror of the first time this happens uh, in, in the 70s with the British. Callahan got this IMF deal, and it's a horrible deal. They, were, they, they turned white at the prospect of this. They were horrified. Because they had this like remit to you know, keep doing uh, parliamentary socialism. They, they're people, they won a majority with the promise to, to fucking do the do. So they went to their, uh, uh, so they went to the party and they said, okay, what do you guys think? And they said, no, we have this alternative, this Benite socialist program where we're going to literally just take over these banking institutions. And then Callahan just went back to the U.S. with that and said, look, this is what these guys want. This is crazy. Look at these guys. The, and this is, they were hoping they could get a better deal. They were hoping they could get better terms. But what they didn't realize is that this was the condition. Like this was, this relationship had to be established. This new reality had to be established. There's no cutting the corners on this. This is an existential question. Same thing for the Germans. The Germans getting paid back was existentially necessary. So it's like they were willing, and the reason they were willing to hold the line there in both cases is because they knew that the, they could not have the, that the bluff could not be called. Because what's Jim Callahan going to do? Call a general strike?
Would the thoroughly bourgeoisified working class of Britain have done a general strike on James Callahan's command? Maybe, but if he had and it had worked, they probably they would have killed him pretty much immediately. And maybe that leads to a shooting war. And maybe that leads to a, a Cuba-style situation where the fucking queen is forced to flee to Canada on a fucking, like, uh, in the, like the last flight out of, uh, out of the Buckingham Palace. But he doesn't survive that. Probably. Not anybody that high profile. So, in both cases, and what, and what was Shariza going to do? They didn't even they call bring back the drachma and then what? And so in both cases they just called the called the bluff. And so this labor government started the pro program that Thatcher finished, and Thatcher was able to say truthfully when she took office that she was not doing anything radical; she was completing the labor project. Or maybe you get, here's the other thing. And here's the thing that Callahan was probably thinking of. If anybody's ever uh, read A Very British Coup or seen the show, uh, the movie, he was probably thinking of Chile. Or Indonesia before that. He's thinking of like a, a caravan of death of like uh, the Queen's own Westminster guards. Capitalism by the seventies had had the upper hand, and everybody at every level had to come to that question of: Do I existentially confront the state and my own position rel relative to it? Or do I go along? And plenty of people said, no, I won't go along. But they tended to be at the bottom of the power distribution and at the top of the alienation and misery distribution, which meant that their resistance could and was neutralized. I mean, like, whatever Verifacus was planning, uh, there's no way that the U.S. is going to go along with it. That's for sure. We had Germany's back that whole time. So I asked, did the business plot win? And, you know, just you think about like the most radical class warriors in America in the 30s. You got, you know, your Communist Party USA guys, uh, people who went to Spain and shit. And then you've got your business plotters. And uh, they are like the people who just could not accept this uh, condition, the reality of class war in America uh, as it played out in the public sphere in the 30s. They couldn't accept it. The business plotters couldn't, couldn't, they could not, they could not, it didn't matter, oh, it's for capitalism's best interest. Shut up, I can't, my skin burns. It's, I, I, it was a religious violation. They felt it that way. I was talking about it. Like, these are the most true believers. The people who really believe, as opposed to having their belief leavened by self-interest. Like, everybody is a combination of self-interest, like material self-interest, and then the, their self-conception. But for guys like this, at either end, their self-conception so depended on their like, belief that they were willing to uh, see the whole thing collapse. They were willing to see like, in the street class war happen, uh, even if it sacrificed their lives. But there weren't that many of them. Most people throughout the political spectrum were, to one way or another, convinced to wait. Wait and see. There's going to be something that's going to happen. And I know you're saying, well, that's what you're telling us to do. It's like, yeah, but this is a different time. 
We are, we're at the spent end of this. And they both waited. And then first we have the big conflict, spoil up of World War II, and this one, this, this obviates everything. Okay, everybody's interest is in suppressing this like explosion in the global capitalist machinery. Like uh, these guys are, are, these are some bad uh, gaskets that gotta be removed one way or the other. Uh, because, you know, if they win, it's, it's, it's all over. Civilization, the idea, the dream of it is, is over. Uh, including uh, the wealth of American uh, capital. Um, and then the big, the conflict comes in, in the late 40s. That's, that's, that's what everyone was waiting for. And uh, the, th not fault, through contingencies of history, the way events played out, the spontaneous stuff, the stuff that might be fully determined but which we can't know as it's happening and therefore can't assign blame for, leave it so that when that moment comes, the power, the, the organization, the capacity is disproportionately aligned with capital. Which means that by the time we get to this point in, the, in, in uh, capitalism's development, the this, this 60s, 70s uh, crisis point, uh, this terminal trajectory, uh, it's, it's a totally one-sided affair. All right, so next week, I'll probably do a chill-out stream on Wednesday, but no, uh, no book because I'm going to be out of town on starting Thursday. But next Friday, Friday after that, we'll do the next part, which I believe is part four. Right? Let me check. Part four, which is called... Yes, the realization of global capitalism. So this is when we get to the real thing. When, when the American working class's relationship to the state is fundamentally ruptured and changed uh, throughout the reforms of the 70s, uh, and then how that then ripples out. I think we'll probably be talking some Volcker. Volcker's already made appearances like a grubby little, he wasn't little, he was huge. Uh, entity moving through all this stuff. He's a real zealot-like figure for this whole period. Uh, and then that's all going to culminate uh, with his giving the economy the shocker uh, in the late 70s. So we'll be talking about that uh, two weeks. Ah, bye. What is this gizmo?